Hi, everybody. This is Marlene with Erie News, and today is March 11th, 2024. Monday, March 11th, 2024. And let's start off with a good ghost story. This is out of Stranger Than Fiction Stories, and it's titled The Elemental of Leap Castle. And I'm not sure if it's Leap or Lape or, but whatever. I'm going to say Leap. I don't want anybody to get offended if I'm mispronouncing it. When when and how a non-human spirit known as the Elemental came to haunt Leap Castle in Ireland is unknown. Its origins, the first person to encounter it, and even its exact nature until this day are shrouded in mystery. Leap Castle, located in County Offaly, has a reputation of being haunted by a non-human spirit since time immemorial. The identity of who conjured it is varied. One theory is that the Druids used the place as a sacred site before the castle was built and left the elemental there as a sentinel. There is evidence that Leap Castle was constructed on the same site as another ancient stone structure, perhaps ceremonial in nature, and that the area has been occupied consistently since at least the Iron Age, about 500 BC, and possibly since Neolithic times. Gerald Fitzgerald, Earl of Kildare, a magic practitioner who attempted to take the castle's belief to have invoked it in order to burn the castle down. Another belief is that the spirit is not elemental at all, but the ghost of an ancient O'Carroll, a leper who died in the castle. This explains the rotting stink that accompanies a manifestation as well as the decomposing facial features described by those who have seen it. The O'Carroll were a brutal clan that continuously fought in order to secure dominion in the area. In 1659, the castle passed by marriage into the ownership of the Darby family. Mildred Dill married into the Darby family in 1889. She was said to have dabbled in the occult and spiritualism. As a writer of Gothic novels and perhaps for inspiration, she conducted seances, something her attempts to contact the other side, either awoke or summoned the elemental. Or perhaps it was a discovery in those years of the entrance to the Ubilet, where prisoners were thrown in so they could die a slow death. The bones of approximately 150 bodies were retrieved. Soon after this, Mildred Darby had her encounter with the elemental. The elemental makes its presence known through provocation, and the Ryans who have lived there since 1991 have not encountered it. The following is an excerpt of an article that appeared in the Democrat Chronicle newspaper in 1897 titled Discoveries in Leap Castle. Quote, a series of interesting finds just discovered in the historic Leap Castle are described as, as a first. An 11th century stone spiral staircase springing from the first floor level and terminating at the summit of the Great Tower, 100 feet high. The finely cut stone steps are laid with mathematical accuracy and are large, like the passage itself. The O'Carrolls, princes of Eli, whose chief stronghold this castle was, were all big men, a race of giants as a few relics of them extant attest. The second find is an entrance to the guardroom cut out of the rock, and which was up to the present believed to be a mass of solid masonry. Here numerous bones, coins of the reign of Edward the Confessor, and other relics were found. Human bones in large quantities, flints and spearheads, were also found in the extensive range of dungeons, which have been brought to light beneath the castle. These curious prison houses being rock-hewn, and their existence having been previously unknown to the owner of the castle and the lord of the soul, Jonathan C. Darby. The present owner has put into a complete state of preservation the ancient chapel, an apartment 25 feet square and high, which is on top of the tower, and here has been discovered a very large and fine early English window from which its great elevation commands a view embracing eight counties. A little below this is a remarkable room, which none of the servants will enter after nightfall. It was a state bedroom of one of the princes of Eli, who was murdered six centuries ago by her lord, and the solid oak door retains the bloodstains of the royal victim. This part of the building is reputed to be haunted, and Mr. and Mrs. Darby, who do not believe in ghosts, admit that they cannot account for the extraordinary noises that occasionally come from the death chamber of the murdered princess, and which make it nearly impossible for them to retain their female servants in their employment. The manifestations are reputed to take the form of shrieks, which resound and reverberate through the building, and set all the dogs in the kennels whining and barking. 
The best description of the elemental was given by Mildred Darby and a friend staying at Leap. This is an excerpt as written in the Occult Review circa 1908 in an article titled Kilman Castle, the House of Horror. Quote, Suddenly two hands were laid on my shoulders. I turned around sharply and saw, as clearly as I see you now, a great thing, standing a couple of feet from me, with its bent arms raised, as if it were cursing me. I cannot describe in words how utterly awful the thing was, its very undefinableness, rendering the horrible shadow more gruesome. Human in shape a little shorter than I am, I could just make out the shape of big black holes like great eyes and sharp features, but the whole figurehead, face, hands, and all was gray, unclean, Bluish gray, something of the color and appearance of common cotton wool, but oh, so sinister, repulsive, and devilish. My friends, who are clever about occult things, says it is what they call an elemental. The thing was about the size of a sheep, thin, gaunt, and shadowy in parts. Its face was human, or to be more accurate, inhuman, in its vileness, with large holes of blackness for eyes, loose slobbery lips, and a thick saliva dripping jaw sloping back suddenly into a neck. Nose it had none, only spreading cancerous cavities, the whole face being a uniform tint of gray. This too is the color of the dark coarse hair covering its head, neck, and body. Its forearms were thickly coated with the same hair, so were its paws, large, loose, and hand-shaped, and it sat on its hind legs. One hand or paw was raised, and a claw-like finger was extended ready to scratch the paint. Its lusterless eyes which seemed half decomposed and looked incredibly foul, stared into mine, and the horrible smell, which had before offended my nostrils only a hundred times intensified, came up to my face, filling me with a deadly nausea. I noticed the lower half of the creature was indefinite and seemed semi-transparent. At least I could see the framework of the door that led into the gallery through its body. End quote. The following is a response to the article that appeared in the Occult Review, which related a personal account while staying at the hospital. I'm sorry, at the castle. Quote, I saw your eyes fixed upon something above our heads, and the next minute my own eyes were filled by the sight of a thing in the gallery looking down at us. There was plenty of light from the lamps in the hall, and the one above on the wall at the corner of the gallery, for every one of us to see quite plainly the great colored figure about the height of a small grown-up person looking down at us. I wish I thought I could ever forget the sight of that gray figure with dark spots like holes in its head instead of eyes, standing with gay arms folded on the gallery railing looking down at us. Then just as he put foot on the gallery, the thing that he saw there that we were watching suddenly faded out of sight. The thing did not move only because less and less visible until it vanished. End quote. Mildred Darby sent the following letter to Sidney Carroll about the last time she saw the elemental. The last appearance of the Elemental was on November 25, 1915. On that date, two of our servants, knowing the master would be late and that I was driving that afternoon, had invited friends, two soldiers from the barracks at Bird, distant the other side six miles. They came rather late and my husband came home early so the visitors had to be kept out of his sight in the lower regions of one of the wings, the priest house, and weren't able to be shown the center tower, the very lofty hall. At 7.15, my husband and I went up to dress for dinner. My room is an extremity of the house from the kitchen, his dressing room next door to me. While dressing, I was startled by a loud yell of terror, stricken male and female voices coming apparently from the hall, and ran out to see the cause. My husband was out ahead of me. At his heels, I passed through the corridor of one wing and onto the gallery wing, round two sides of hall, two lamps on the gallery, two more in hall below. On the gallery, leaning with hands resting on its rail, I saw the thing, yellow mental, and smelt it only too well. At the same moment, my husband pulled up sharply, about ten feet from the thing, and half-turning let fly a volley of abuse at me, ending up dressing up a thing like that to try and make a fool of me. And now you'll say I've seen something, and I have not seen anything, and there is nothing to see, or ever was. This last speech, without a pause, began waving one hand at the thing, and ended up by stalking back to his dressing room, still abusing me for trying to give him a fright. As he was speaking, the elemental grew fainter and fainter in its outlines until it disappeared. By the sounds from my husband's room, I judged he was employed as I was myself, in preparing an empty spot for our coming dinner. 
He never made any inquiry as to that yell that called us both out, and from that day to this has not mentioned the incident to me. I heard from our servants that when we went to dress for dinner, they had brought their friends just to show them the hall, when all four had suddenly seen and smelt the elemental looking down at them from the gallery. We all got such a turn. We couldn't help letting out a ball and then fled to the servants' quarters where all four were very sick. The two maids had letters necessitating their going home next day, and they did not return. End quote. In 1922, Leap Castle was burned during the Irish Civil War. The family went to England for a short period of time, and they returned back to Ireland to live with family in County Longford at Dury Hall. The move to Ireland was in order to get compensation for the burning of the castle through the 1923 Compensation to Property Act. Mildred Darby claimed she lost at least two drawers of writings that she had hoped to publish in the future. The family never returned to the estate, and Mildred never published again under the name of Andrew Mary. She passed away on January 5, 1932. Only a burnt-out shell of the chapel remained after the fire in 1922. It is considered very haunted as well, and the stories predate the time of the blaze. There's a story of murder during the time the O'Carrolls lived there, when one of them killed his own brother, a priest who was performing Mass, the reason being a bid for power. At nightfall, light is seen streaming from the barren windows. The spirit of the murdered priest is seen at the stairwell, accompanied by the smell of burning rubber. There is also a story of a woman who met her end at the hand of the O'Carrolls, who is occasionally seen running through the grounds, as if her attacker is still in pursuit. Chances are this is a version of the story of the Red Lady. One story is that she was taken by one of the O'Carroll men. Soon she was pregnant with his child. When it was born, he killed it with a blade, and the mother, in absolute despair, grabbed a knife and did away with herself. She is said to roam around wearing a long red dress with her long brown hair flowing out behind her. She always carries a dagger. Mildred Darby also witnessed ghostly events. She said, quote, There's something heavy that lies on people's beds and snores. They feel the weight of a great body pressing against them in a room in the priest's house. A monk with a tonsure and cows walks in at one window and out another in the priest's house. End quote. Two other ghosts from Leap Castle are Emily and Charlotte. They lived on the estate during the 1600s, and it is difficult to prove if they indeed existed. Emily died when she was 11 years old after falling from the battlements. Charlotte is seen dragging a deformed leg behind her. There are stories of a child falling from the heights of the castle, only to disappear before hitting the ground. The following are descriptions of other encounters at Leap Castle, but much recent, much more recent. This is from June 2002. Quote, I traveled to Leap Castle in order to make a show for a local TV network, and this was my first time in the notorious castle I had heard so much about. So the show went well, but I wanted to try the UV on the camp quarter while still shooting. I had sent something down the old access to the battlements earlier and never went down. I climbed the stairs with a camp quarter in front. The light from the UV allowed me to see about six feet ahead and no more, so I climbed slowly. I opened the Gothic-style door and made my way slowly down the narrow passage. About ten feet in, I thought I saw something move, and I lifted my head. I could feel something was wrong, but I had no idea what. This time with the camera dropped, I thought I saw a glow come from around the corner, and then it went back in. I stood and studied this for a while, and thought it may be a side effect of the UV, which can be common. A few steps more, my body was weakening fast. It was a strange sensation. Suddenly, this mass of white light mist raced around the corner like a bull. Even the rubbish on the floor scattered as it approached at speed. The passage was tight, and I turned to my left to try and get out but it was too late. I felt the pain as if something had just pierced under my right rib cage, and went all the way through to the back. This startled me a little, and we proceeded to arrange shooting in the cellars. The audio refused to tape again in the cellars, and I felt really odd. I was sweating heavily and was becoming very weak and drowned in dread. Right after the incident in the tunnel, it felt as if a hole in my chest had been punctured on a spiritual level, and my life was seeping into the stones. In order to describe it and let the reader, reader understand, they would have had to experience a large blood loss sometime in their lives. As they felt the blood drain, this weakness would become prominent. Other words, they were experiencing the onset of death. I was dying. This is another encounter from 2006. I looked into the darkness of a corridor that exited the spiral stairway. 
I became aware of the smell of sulfur. It was as if boxes and boxes of matches had suddenly been lit at once. I looked at my friend who had taken me to visit Leap Castle. He could also smell the sulfur. I stared into the darkness of the corridor and had the impression that a beast like a bear or lion was staring back at me. The tension was rising like a ticking time bomb. My friend then closed the door and said to let sleeping dogs lie. Meaning something, sometimes you have just... You have you just have to leave things alone. He was a friend of Sean Ryan, and I certainly did not want to disrespect either of them by stirring up the elemental. End quote. After the Darbys left Leap Castle, it stood empty for 50 years until 1972. Peter Bartlett, an Australian historian whose mother was in O'Bannon, bought the structure and commenced a renovation. He died in 1989 before the work could be completed. In 1991, Sean Ryan purchased the property and continued with the restoration. He had also opened part of the castle to tours. There are also lesser-known wraiths that haunt Leap Castle. There's an elderly man sitting by the fire in the main hall, and what is left of the priest's house, a burly man, dressed like a peasant, is seen pushing a heavy barrel up the sta back stairs near the servants' quarters. When he reaches the top, the barrel rolls backward and disappears. How's that for a good ghost story? I've heard of this place. It's 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 uh, several of the paranormal shows have gone there. Very interesting place. I'm sure there's a lot of history. Let me tell you something. Just that thing of that upulet upulet. Can you imagine just throwing somebody in there like letting them? Par oh, that's horrible. So yeah, I'm not surprised that not not only does is there um, hauntings, but dark, of course. Okay, the next story is also out of Stranger Than Fiction Stories and it's titled The Russian's Ghost. Minds both mysterious and treacherous are believed by the men that work there to be haunted. Sometimes these apparitions try to give a warning of, of pending disaster. Other times they lure the living to their doom. In Grant Town, West Virginia, the federal number one mine operated from 1901 until 1985 was said to be haunted by a Russian miner. In Grand Town, West Virginia, the federal number one mine was built by the Federal Coal and Coke Company, and immigrants came from across the world to make a living there. But death could be found as well, whether from an explosion or rock falls. They brought their language, customs, and ghost lore. The Ukrainians believed in ghosts called Shubin, who warned miners of impending danger, but not all the time. The origins of the belief in Shubin is that it is a ghost of a dead miner who walks in a fur coat at the bottom of the mine with a torch in his hand and burns the gas. Another is that he was a 19th century mining master who could predict collapses and would warn the miners if one was impending. In a darker version, there was a taskmaster named Shubin who killed those working in the mines. Eventually he was killed, but his spirit is said to hunt underground drains in the form of a stooped old man in a fur coat with pitted felt boots. He is a portent of coming death to whoever sees him. In 1961, Jimmy Dean performed a song, Big Bad John, based on this character. In the song, he was described as a very tall and muscular man, a quiet man. Rumors were that he left New Orleans after killing a man over a Cajun queen. He sacrificed himself when a timber cracked inside the mine, and he held it aloft so his co-workers could escape. However, it collapsed before he could get out. Okay, and... And the lyrics are here, and it tells exactly that. And whether this man actually, I, b I believe it was, um, it was a big song back in 1961 when Jimmy Dean released it. It's like a ballad type of thing. And now the other story is that this miner was a Russian and lived close to the mine in a little shack. One day, he became careless with explosive and he blew his head off. A few days later, a miner descending into the mine early one morning heard someone breathe heavily next to him. When he turned around, the light from his helmet shone on a terrible sight. It was a headless man holding his head with a big smile on it under one arm. With nowhere to go, the miner just shut his eyes. He opened them when the cage landed, but the apparition had disappeared. I know mine's have a lot of different weird stuff like the Tommy knockers. There's a lot of, there's a whole slew of paranormal things that are attached or, you know, urban myths and things like that, that are just mind things. Let's go over for the next story to 
out of space. And this is titled Rare 11th Century Chart Star Chart Reveals Complex History of Islamic, Jewish, and Christian Astronomy. A precious astrolabe or astrolabe was found languishing in a museum in the Italian city of Verona. The astrolabe is a device used for accurately calculating the date and time based on star positions. Found in a museum in Verona, Italy, is clear evidence for scientific exchange and cooperation between Muslim, Jewish, and Christian people, a new study finds. The astrolabe stands out because, having been built by Muslim craftsmen, it subsequently passed through the hands of Jewish and Christian users who translated and modified the handheld device over the centuries. Such a widely shared astrolabe dating from almost a thousand years ago is an extremely rare find. The bronze astrolabe languished in the archives of Verona's Fondazion Museo Minisacci Ediso for decades. Its true worth unrealized until the museum's curator, Giovanna Residori, became curious and caught the attention of Federica Gigante, a historian at the University of Cambridge who specializes in material and intellectual exchanges between Islamic people in Europe. The current curator thought it was an intriguing object and wanted to know more about it. Giganti said, Just by chance, I saw it on the museum website, so it was a happy coincidence. Upon inspecting the astrolabe, Giganti was astonished to find just how complex the history of this particular device was. Astrolabes were invented by the ancient Greeks, but no astrolabes survived from that time. Rather, the earliest examples are from the late 8th century and were constructed by Arab astronomers who led the world at the time in terms of their scientific skills. Astrolabes are constructed from a disk around the rim of which either the time or degrees of angular separation are marked. Pinned to this disk are one or more circular plates, each plate for a specific latitude. And on top of that is another plate called a rete, pronounced riti, sorry, on which there is a chart depicting the brightest stars in the sky. The idea is to rotate the riti so that the position of the stars matches what's in the sky, and then to use the hour scale around the rim to determine the time. Astrolabes were designed by Muslim craftsmen specifically with religious use in mind. Every mosque would have had one, said Gigante. That makes perfect sense because the chief function of an astrolabe is to tell the time. And that's one thing a museum does from a minaret, which is to chant the hour of prayer. There are a dozen or so examples of astrolabes of Arab construction in museum collections worldwide. But what makes the Verona astrolabe stand out is that it also features inscriptions in Hebrew and in a Western language used in Christian countries at the time. In this case, probably Italy. Giganti says that the astrolabe was probably constructed in Spain in the late 11th century. She can't be sure exactly when, though. The star positions are not so accurate that I could date it from them, she said. Earth wobbles on its axis, a motion called precession that sees the position of the stars relative to the North Pole shift in a cycle that lasts 26,000 years. Over the thousand years since the astrolabe was constructed, the stars have shifted relative to a fixed background by about 14 degrees, but Giganti found that trying to rewind the sky to match the positions on the astrolabe in order to determine when the astrolabe was made didn't work, because the star's positions on the astrolabe are not as accurate as modern measurements. Instead, Giganti scoured ancient tables of stellar coordinates that astrolabes of this era would have been derived from. She focused on those from Al and Andalus, which was a museum-ruled area of what is now Spain. Both Muslim and Jewish people lived side by side in El Andalus and all spoke Arabic. The Verona astrolabe features an inscription in Arabic, reading for Ishak, the work of Junus. In English, those names are Isaac and Jonah, and are likely Jewish monikers written in Arabic, hence Giganti's focus on El Andalus. If we think about what Spain was like in the 11th century, there were many different observatories where attempts were made at drawing up charts of star coordinates and planet positions. And these were working groups of scientists that always comprised Jews and Muslims working alongside each other, says Gigante. Although she could not identify a specific table of stellar coordinates, 
that informed the Verona astrolabe. She did find one dating from Al Andalus in 1068 that was close. This is supported by more inscriptions on one of the reversible plates, which state that they are for the latitudes of Cordoba and Toledo, both of which are cities in the region. However, at some point, the astrolabe appears to have changed hands. A second plate was added with an Arabic inscription saying it was for use in North Africa, somewhere in present-day Egypt or Morocco. After this, the astrolabe received further modifications. Arabic markings were crossed out and translated into Hebrew, the language of Jewish people in the rest of the world. After that, faint numerals written in a Western language were also scratched into the disk before the astrolabe ultimately ended up in the hands of Ludovico Moscardo, a 17th century nobleman of Verona. It became part of the collection in his Moscardo Museum, which in 1964 was absorbed into the Fondazione Museo Miniscalci Erizo, before finally coming to Giganti's attention. Astrolabes were the smartphones of their time. Every educated person, especially those working on astronomical or astrological matters, would have had one San Giganti. Half of these users, users such as the museums and their minarets, would have used them to make astronomical re readings for religious regions. The other half would have employed them for astrological purposes. Back in the 11th century, when our understanding of the heavens was limited, astronomy and astrology were considered the same thing. When the astrolabe got into Jewish and Christian hands, I expect it was used for more astrological purposes than religious ones, though monks used astrolabes as well for prayer times, said Giganti. Astrolabes with inscriptions in Hebrew are exceptionally rare. Gigante knows of one in the British Museum in London, but no others, although many were likely lost to the ravages of time. However, their rarity emphasizes how much how much most astrolabes from this era were of Muslim origin and used exclusively by Muslims. The Verona astrolabe is therefore of historical importance because its origins are equally Islamic, Jewish, and Christian. It is a timely reminder, given current tragic events, that in the past, different people could coexist and share knowledge. It's really funny because the other day <clears throat> I was watching the movie, The Name of the Rose. This is the original one with Sean Connery. And a very, very, very young Christian Slater. There's a part of the movie where the character that Sean Connery plays, what was his name? Something of Baskerville. William of Baskerville, I think it is, pulls out an astrolabe. And he's using it. He's trying to look out the window. But then when he hears another monk coming, he hides it. And I don't know if... I've never heard of the church saying anything, because at that point this was purely scientific. But uh, yeah, that was very unusual. That I, I remember seeing that in that movie. Anyway, let's go back to Stranger Than Fiction Stories. The next story is titled <laughs> Dr. Dill's Dilemma. Hold on, let's see, here we go. The end of 1909 was fast approaching when charges were levied against the county hospital for the insane at Overbrook. It was started as a miscommunication spawned an investigation that revealed graft, mismanagement, and a possible murder. Date, December 1st, 1909, placed Newark, New Jersey. Marianne Mayow and Sophia Keysweater's mother had been an inmate of an insane asylum for 30 years. The family went to see her every visiting day until she was removed to the Overbrook about six years before. They had not gone more often because their mother was unable to recognize them. However, they called every month to check on her. In November 1909 is when they were told that she died, August 3rd and was buried the next day in a potter's field. The sisters insisted that the officials had their names and addresses on record, and that as of two weeks before they were told she was alive. It was only after they pressed the matter that the hospital authorities admitted that they didn't have a record of Mrs. Bauer having been in the asylum at all. Before then, they told her family she's doing fine, and that she was about the same as before. Mrs. Mayel's Address was 29 Washington Avenue, Irvington, and Sophia Keysweaters was 183 Clinton Avenue, New York. This might seem unimportant, but the authorities later claim 
They had neither address on the patient's records. Then they said Mrs. Mayo had said her address was in New York when it was in Irvington, which is why the notice didn't reach her. The sisters complained that for weeks they were told their mother was alive, when in truth she was buried in a potter's field. The family had set aside a plot for her in Clinton Cemetery well before her death. Marianne Mayo filled out an affidavit refuting what the officials said. She said 26 Washington Street had been their home for the last 14 years, and her husband had been working for the post office for the same amount of time. They would have been notified of a wrongly addressed piece of mail, and it would have reached them. Dr. McCormick, who was in charge of the ward, said, quote, Mary Ann Bauer, a longtime patient here, died on August 3rd of pneumonia. On her death, we looked up the records and found an address, 26 Washington Street, Newark. Our records showed that none of the relatives of the patient had visited her in two years, and when we got no responses from the Washington Street address, the body was turned over to an undertaker for burial. We knew nothing more of the case until yesterday when Mrs. Mayo of 26 Washington Avenue, Irvington, called up and asked about her mother, end quote. Dr. Daniel M. Dill, who was in charge of the asylum, could not be reached. The reason most probably being that this story about the missing Mrs. Bauer coincided with the recent discovery of a skeleton of an unidentified woman in the attic of the former Essex County Insane Asylum. A family friend of the sisters had gone to the asylum to see another patient. While there, she looked for Mrs. Bauer, but had been unable to find her. She was the one who told the daughters to contact the asylum, which is when they were told she had died on August 3rd. Due to the mistakes exposed by the Bauer case, a rigid overhauling of the system of keeping records at the Overbrook Asylum for the insane was to be started at once. During examination of the records, it was found there was absolutely no complete record of the total number of patients in the hospital. Dr. Dill insisted that any discrepancies in the records were owing to a fire at the old Camden Street Hospital 30 years before. <clears throat> Excuse me. Things didn't get any better for Dr. Dill. When detectives started to investigate, the charred skeleton found at the abandoned South Orange Avenue Asylum, which was the old Essex County Asylum, on November 8, 1909. Later, it was thought to belong to an unrecorded patient named Catherine, or Kitty, Littner. This scandal worried the freeholders of the asylum the most. It was said her history was undocumented, since the former superintendent failed to properly transcribe the records of the patients who were transferred from the Candom Street Asylum to the now-abandoned South Orange Avenue Institution. But this mystery woman was not the only one without a history of her identity, her diagnosis and treatment plan. It was discovered that 40 patients were removed from the old Camden Street Institution to the South Orange Avenue Institution without any record of their cases. The skeleton was found and the skeleton found was determined to belong to a woman of about 50 years of age and that she had been dead from 5 to 10 years. They knew it was left there after 1894 when the building was wired for electricity and the electrical contractors did not find anything there. Another theory was that if no female patient was unaccounted for, then the skeleton must belong to a visitor at the institution. A third possibility was the remains belonged to a patient who escaped and returned to the place where she was found. The asylum already had a taste of scandal a few years before. The prior superintendent, Dr. Hinckley, was accused of having taken home a patient named Catherine Dace. When he quit working at the hospital, he took her and made her maid at his house for the next 30 years. He claimed he had given her a better life than if she would have stayed in the asylum. Another story came from Francisca or Fanny Hinkle as to the fate of Catherine Lidner. The affidavit she signed described the following which occurred on February 25, 1905. This is five years before this whole thing with the Bauer discovery and all that. Quote, my daughter Anna Hinkle entered the Essex County Hospital for the insane on November 4th, 1903, and my husband, who is now dead, and I did not see her until February 1904. We saw her for the first time on February 21st after we had been informed by a nurse at the hospital that our daughter had been ill-treated. We found her with her head split open, and after some delay got permission to take her out of the hospital on parole. End quote. What had brought Annie Hinkle to the asylum was that in April 1908, she had disappeared. 
She had left home to visit friends, but never arrived there. She had a history of an unsound mind. But what her mother witnessed confirmed that taking her away was the best course of action. Mrs. Hinkle described where she saw nurse pull Catherine Lidner, who she knew as Kitty, into the ward by the hair, and when she resisted, called two more nurses and a woman patient, and the four took her to the room of one of the nurses. They threw her on the floor. One of the nurses sat on her. One held her feet, and the woman patient held her arms over her head on instruction from one of the nurses. Then one of the nurses picked up a chair in the room and struck the Lidner woman across the head. She continued her story, quote, I saw blood flow from her nose, ears, and mouth. And before a second blow could fall, I had hold of the chair, telling the nurse to be ashamed of herself, and that it was no wonder my daughter had told me she had received the same treatment when she saw the trouble start, and asked, had asked me to leave the ward with her. The Lidner woman lay motionless on the floor, and when I turned to go, I was cautioned by the nurses not to say anything of what had happened to the doctors. When I got downstairs, and while I was talking to one of the doctors there, Dr. Dill, the superintendent of the hospital, came down from his office on the second floor, and after being informed by the other physician that I was taking my daughter out, told me to remember that I would be held responsible if anything should happen to her. I told him that I knew that very well, and that nothing worse could happen to her than what I had just witnessed in Ward 10. I repeated that twice to him and told him to go to Ward 10, and he told me to mind my business and go. On the next day, February 26, one of the nurses who had held the Lidner woman on the floor came to my house and told me that Mrs. Lidner had died two hours after she had been struck and cautioned me not to say anything about it. When I asked her if the woman had been buried or where she was to be buried, the nurse said that at the hospital this question had been asked of two doctors, and one had replied, either in Woodland or Fairmont Cemetery. The nurse stayed for supper, and while we were talking, after supper, another nurse, the one who had been sitting on the Linder woman, came to see me. We naturally spoke about the Linder case, and the second visitor said to us, The less you have to say about it, the better it is for both of you. Both left my house at about nine o'clock in the evening together. They told me, that if I talked, they would have my daughter just released on probation, taken back to the asylum. I was afraid and for my daughter's sake, have held my peace. End quote. Mrs. Hinkle then went, on, went to both cemeteries, mentioned by the nurse, and asked if anyone from the asylum had been sent over to be buried, and they said no. Fanny Hinkle said that Mrs. Lindner had a friend named Mrs. Carl who lived on Camden Street. When Mrs. Carl went to visit Catherine at the asylum, she was told by Samuel Smith, who was making out the passes for visitors, that Mrs. Lindner was not there anymore. Dr. Dill, described as a man in the days, would only say, I don't know how it happened. I have no information on the subject. It was inevitable that Dr. Daniel M. Dill, as head of the county hospital for the insane, while not charged with willful neglect, was found to be incompetent by November grand jury since the records kept were so defective and imperfect as to be almost valueless. Eventually, it was found that Catherine Lindner was in the hospital as late as the early part of 1904, where she was transferred from Ward 1 to Ward 10, which was the violent ward and with an easy access of the attic, where the burned skeleton was found. Further into the investigation, it came out the person who had signed on behalf of Dr. Dill to transfer Catherine Lindner from Ward 1 to Ward 10 was a man who had previously been a patient in the asylum before 1904. He was discharged as cured and then hired as an employee. He recalled signing a card for Catherine Lindner, however her name did not appear on the hospital records. Before the year was out, the newspapers printed the story that Catherine Lindner, a maniac, was killed by three nurses and was secreted in the roof with the cognizance of Dr. Daniel M. Dill. The name of the nurse who hit the Lindner across the head was Grace Brush. Dr. Dill insisted Catherine Lindner never existed and was a creation of Mrs. Hinkle. In another example of poor management, on December 8, 1909, it was revealed that on July 29th, relatives of Virginia E. Hogan, 63, who had been at the asylum for three months, received a telegram saying she was dead. Later the same day, another telegram, this one signed by Dr. Dill, reached the relative saying that a mistake had been made. 
and that Mrs. Hogan was not dead. The family, prior to the second telegram, had made arrangements to claim the body. Virginia Hogan's sister said her sibling had been sent to the old South Orange Avenue Asylum on May 22nd by request of her son, Russell Hogan, and the rest of the family knew nothing of the matter until she was in the asylum. They had visited frequently, and the last time in July, they were not allowed admission since Dr. Stiles said Mrs. Hogan was worse. This was the same Dr. Stiles that Mrs. Hinkle told police in 1908 had been pursuing her daughter, Annie. The undertaker, who had gone to the hospital to pick up the body, had to hunt around for a long time and ask a lot of people for information until they found the body in the basement with a name tag of Hogan Caldwell on it. When he asked about the body, he was told it was not the one he came for and that they had notified the wrong family. In the meantime, Anne Duffy, 88, died at the asylum on December 11, 1909. She had been in, an inmate since 1881 and was formerly known in many sections of Newark. There was no record at the asylum of her relatives' names. Under the former condition, she would have been buried in the potter's field. However, when the news of her death was published, relatives from Brooklyn came to the undertaking rooms of Charles F. Hellman with the information that they had a plot in Woodland Cemetery and wanted the body buried there. Another serious error found while the records were being reviewed was that a physician signed commitment papers as the patient instead of the actual patient. The more the investigation dug into the asylum, the worse it looked as to the mismanagement of the Essex County Hospital for the insane. It was reported that 22 inmates were unaccounted for, and there were 20 inmates of which there was no record in the books. Two patients who had been reported dead were found alive, and the name of a woman long since dead was found in the census as alive. There were patients of which there was no record whatsoever. This gave rise to the possibility that there were people in the asylum who were sane. The system, or lack thereof, for running the hospital did not prevent unscrupulous persons with the aid of unscrupulous physicians to commit to the asylum persons who were sane. Dill might be dazed, but he stated that he had no intention of resigning. However, a chief justice said to the December grand jury that, quote, if it is proof that the woman whose skeleton was found met a violent death, those responsible for the death might be indicted for murder. End quote. If things could get worse for Dr. Dill, they did on December 22, 1909, when a young woman was informed her father had died in the South Orange Avenue Insane Asylum. She had the body brought home only to discover it was not her father, and she found him alive in the asylum. Another man told the newspaper that on June 1, 1879, his wife, Mary Coffey, was admitted to the old hospital in Camden Street, and she was discharged on April 30, 1882. In 1905, he received a slip of paper signed by Dr. Daniel A. Dill that, quote, Mary Coffey, admitted June 1, 1879, died April 30, 1882. End quote. Review of records found that other persons other than Dr. Dill who were authorized to issue passes were unfit to do so. One was Samuel Smith, an epileptic, who in 1909 was an inmate at Overbrook, and John Decker, who had gone to, on to become an assistant clerk at the district court. It was Smith's handwriting which had written a pass to see Catherine Lindner in 1904. The story continued in 1910, when an inmate, Elizabeth Leahy, known as Diamond Hinckley, said she worked with Catherine Lindner, in the laundry in the old South Orange Avenue Asylum. Diamond Hinckley not only remembered Catherine Lindner being in Ward 10 in 1904, she also remembered the names of all the doctors and nurses. This contradicted Dr. Dill, who said Catherine Lindner never existed within the asylum walls. The asylum freeholders also heard for the first time of a fire in the asylum on the night of June 30, 1909. Dr. John O. Gaston said that during the fire, Several of the attendants were drunk and smoking about the place, even though it was prohibited. It turned out that drinking, smoking, and fighting among the attendants was common. In January 1910, it was alleged that Dr. Dill had been privy to, or had through negligence, permitted some graft in the use and distribution of supplies for the asylum. As a probe continued, it was found that assistant druggist's husband, his last name is husband, by the way, caught an inmate taking morphine pills, presumably to give to the attendants. Prior to this, it was not kept in a locked cabinet. 
In March, the newspapers printed that influence was being used to delay asylum charges. Rumor was that politicians were at work to hold up reports of indictments. By April, it seemed it had been tacitly agreed by the members of the committee to drop the charges against Dill in connection with the skeleton mystery and other tangibles in the Overbrook affairs and allow him to stay until his term expired on December 13, 1911. But Dr. Dill wasn't out of the woods. By May, a new warden, Charles A. Stedman, had a problem with him when he refused to turn over keys to two rooms in the administration building that had been given to him for his use by the hospital committee. In June, Dill was forced to give up the keys for the female wards and the nurses' home to Warden Stedman. The subject of what would happen to Dr. Dill became a moot point when he died in June of 1911 following an illness of a nervous disease caused by a fall from a scaffold while the Overbrook Institution was in the course of erection. He was 71 years old and had survived the Civil War where he served as a captain. In 1917, one of the most infamous events occurred at the Overbrook Asylum. The boiler stopped working, leaving the inmates without heat for 20 days during the winter. 24 persons died of the cold, many freezing to death in their beds. Annie Hinkle would end up institutionalized again and died in 1935 at age 51 at the State Asylum in Monmouth, New Jersey. As the years passed, the Overbrook became derelict, and in 2007, a new site was purchased. During its 100-plus years of taking in patients, about 10,000 people died under its roof, most of them of natural causes. The entire complex, which had tunnels connecting all the buildings, was demolished in 2018, and new townhouses were built on the land. The identity of the woman's charred skeleton found in the attic was never resolved, and whether she was the unfortunate Catherine Lindner, who was murdered, remains a mystery. So, obviously, people came and left, died, escaped, whatever. And then these doctors, since I guess they knew that the records were so, I don't know, incomplete, would just say, nah, she's never existed here. And then you have all these people going around saying, yeah, we, she was here all this time. We knew her, you know, we visited her or, or things like this. And it makes you think that, yeah, that she might have been that lady that was beaten up and these nurses or whoever responsible, maybe even the doctors was like, just put her in this, up there in the attic because we don't want any questions. You know, this we basically they knew that they had a witness who had seen Mrs. Hinkle had seen her get beaten up. So they know they have a witness, but what is it? No body, no crime. So they thought, you know what? We can't send her to get buried even, uh, you know, as under a fake name. Just put her in the attic. At least, I don't know. That's my theory on it. But I wouldn't be surprised. A real eye-opener, huh? Okay. This next story is out of Daily Mail and is titled... A little bit on the scary side, if you ask me. Hold on, let me go back up here. Rise of the Slaughterbots. AI drone designed to hunt and kill people is built in just hours by scientists for a game. Well, that's, that's comforting. Swarms of killer AI drones might sound like the plot of a dystopian science fiction thriller, but a terrifying glimpse of the future once scientists has shown just how easy it already is to build an assassination drone that can hunt down and kill people. In just a few hours, Louis Weenus, an engineer and entrepreneur, converted a $115 drone into the basis of a deadly weapon. Using AI facial recognition, the drone was programmed to recognize individuals and race towards them at full speed. Although Mr. Weenus says he built the drone for a game, he also says he wanted to raise awareness of for how easily this could be used for a deadly terrorist attack. In a video posted to X, formerly Twitter, Mr. Weenus said Mr. Weenus and his engineer colleague demonstrated how a commercial drone can be programmed to chase down targets. In the post, Mr. Weenus writes, I thought it would be fun to build a drone that chases you around as a game. However, the terrifying video quickly shows how dangerous this technology could really be. The drone uses an AI object detection model to recognize faces using its onboard camera. Once it sees a face, the drone is programmed to try and keep it in the center of its view and fly directly forward chasing down its target. In one mode, the drone will charge directly towards anything it recognizes as a face. In this mode, the video shows 
how the drone begins to attack other people in the park, only stopping when Mr. Weenus catches it. The drone also has a second setting which Mr. Weenus describes as an assassination drone. Mr. Weenus wrote, I was also able to add face recognition to it and only make it attack someone it knew who it, who it knew who was. It could easily identify the person from 10 meters distance. The video shows how the drone selectively chooses to chase down its target, ignoring other people. And while this drone is not particularly dangerous, Mr. Weenus warns that more deadly drones could pose a serious threat. He wrote, this literally took just a few hours to build and made me realize how scary it is. You could easily just strap a small amount of explosives on these and let hundreds of them fly around. Oh boy. Uh, on social media, commenters reacted with a mixture of fascination and horror to the invention. Responding to the post, one ex-user wrote, Surface level, this is cool, but the potential to use this for evil is a bit scary. Another commenter added, Yeah, that shouldn't be easy to build. Even Elon Musk, CEO of X, responded to the post by saying, Yeah, it is alarmingly easy. Small, explosive-carrying drones are already having a significant impact on the war in Ukraine. <laughs> These first-person drones are proven to be extremely effective at hunting down and destroying everything from individual troops to tanks and bunkers. But the crucial difference is that these drones are operated by an individual who is always in control of the process rather than an autonomous AI. The real danger is that cheap, easy-to-produce swarms of autonomous drones could be released into battlefields or even public spaces. Mr. Weenus writes, My bet is that we will see some sort of terror attack using this type of tech within the next few years. You still need some technical knowledge to build this now, but it becomes easier and easier. Autonomous drone swarms are yet to be deployed on the battlefield, but DARPA is reportedly developing a drone swarm weapon of mass destruction dubbed AMAS, which stands for Autonomous Multi-Domain Adaptive Swarms of Swarms. Alrighty then. AMAS is still in the planning stages, but DARPA has been collecting bids from suppliers for the $78 million contract. Mr. Weenus wrote, We check for bombs and guns, but there are no anti-drone systems for big events and public spaces yet. We need to build anti-drone systems for civilian spaces as soon as possible. Mr. Weenus describes himself as an open-source absolutist, meaning that he believes important developments in code and AI in particular should be open to the public. And in response to the post, a number of social media users asked Mr. Weenus to release the code or share a full tutorial on how to produce an assassination drone. However, in this instance, he says that he will refrain from posting the code due to the potential danger posed by autonomous drones. I will not post for now. It's honestly super easy to code, but no point enabling, he added. Well, there you go. Another something else to worry about. Uh, you know what? Why not? But, and think about it. How how perfect is even this uh, facial recognition, you know? Especially if somebody's running away or can it confuse some... You know, what if siblings are standing next to each other? Somebody comes up next to you and has similar features and they get... I don't know, this, this, has, <laughs> this has so many things that could go wrong with it. And of course, yeah, there you go. So I will soon be back with you with some more eerie and interesting news from around the world. Till next time, take care.